Hi, and welcome to Shakespeare on Vernaville, episode 6. This episode is about Romeo and Juliet, which was the inspiration for the main plotline in the lore of Vernaville and The Sims 2. To make it a bit easier on myself, I decided to divide this episode into two parts. Part 1, which is this video, is just the summary of the play. It's a completely self-contained video, you don't need to have watched the previous episodes of the series to enjoy it fully. Actually, you could even just be interested in the play and have no knowledge of The Sims and you'd be fine. The character analysis and theorizing about the Veronaville feud will be in part 2, which will be out as soon as I'm done with it. This video will contain a lot of direct quotes because everything is so iconic and I want it to be particularly thorough. Keep in mind that, as usual, I'm quoting a modern English translation, so don't be surprised that certain famous lines are a bit different from what you might remember. For example, Juliet's Wherefore art thou Romeo will be Why must you be Romeo? The modern English translation I'll be quoting was made by Ben Florman and is available on the charts. The link is below. The play takes place in Verona, an Italian city torn apart by a feud between two prominent families, the Capulets and the Montagues. Two servants of the Capulet family, Samson and Gregory, are talking between themselves about their Montague rivals. Samson especially has really internalized the hatred that his Capulet masters feel towards the Montagues, and he talks big about putting the Montagues in their place. Then they notice two servants of the Montagues passing by. They kind of want to fight them, but at the same time they're not that brave, and they're a bit scared that the law might not be on their side if they're the ones initiating a confrontation directly. So instead of doing that, they taunt them with a bit more subtlety. Samson bites his thumb at them, and at that time, biting one's thumb at someone was pretty much the equivalent of giving them the middle finger nowadays. So the Montague servants confront them. Things escalate, and in a minute, all four men have their swords drawn, and they're fighting. The agitation catches the attention of Benvolio, a young Montague lord. Benvolio doesn't want to fight. He draws his sword and tells the servants to stop fighting. Then Tybalt, a young lord of House Capulet, comes in and sees that Benvolio has his sword out. Benvolio tells him that he's just trying to keep the peace, but Tybalt is too happy to seize the opportunity to attack Benvolio, who has no choice but to defend himself. Their fight attracts Veronese citizens, who join in the violence, and soon enough the area becomes a battleground. Enter Lord and Lady Capulet, the patriarch and matriarch of the Capulet House, and Lord and Lady Montague, the heads of the Montague House. The two men want to participate in the fighting, but their wives restrain them. Amidst the chaos, the Prince of Verona, Prince Aeschylus, arrives and puts an end to the hostilities. Aeschylus is pissed. He's sick and tired of the feud between Montagues and Capulets, and all the violence and death that it's been causing. Then he disperses the crowd and everyone leaves except Lord and Lady Montague and Benvolio. Benvolio explains how he saw the fight break out and Lady Montague says that she's glad that her son Romeo wasn't around when it happened. Actually, she wonders where Romeo is. Benvolio and Lord Montague comment that Romeo has been very withdrawn recently. He's been looking very sad and unwilling to say why. As they're talking, Romeo shows up, and Benvolio asks Lord and Lady Montague to leave him alone with him, because he's hoping to be able to get Romeo to share the reason of his sadness one to one. Lord and Lady Montague tactfully leave. Benvolio approaches Romeo and starts a conversation. They're cousins and good friends, and Romeo ends up revealing that his sadness comes from the fact that he's in love with a young lady called Rosaline, but she doesn't love him back. Rosaline has vowed to stay a virgin, which has to mean that she's destined to become a nun, and Romeo is devastated that he can't be with her. 
Benvolio urges him to forget her, since his love is only making him suffer pointlessly, and he tells him to look at other girls, who are also beautiful. But Romeo is convinced that looking at other girls would only make Rosaline's beauty appear more obvious to him by comparison. Benvolio promises to help his cousin move on, but Romeo is really showing zero sign of doing that for now. At the Capulet residence, Lord Capulet is in conversation with Count Paris, a kinsman of Prince Aeschylus. Paris has come to Lord Capulet because he would like Capulet's daughter, Juliet, to become his wife. Lord Capulet holds Paris in high esteem, but he's a bit hesitant to agree to this marriage now because his daughter is still very young. Juliet is 13 years old, and so Capulet suggests that Paris wait two more years. But Paris doesn't want to wait. He says that some girls become mothers at a younger age than Juliet even is right now. It's not particularly unusual, apparently. But Capulet replies that for a girl to have children that early isn't a good thing. He's particularly concerned with his daughter's future because she's the only child he has left, as all of his other children have sadly died, and so she's his only heir. But he tells Paris that if he successfully woos Juliet and she consents to be married to him, then he'll give his permission. And he invites Paris to a party that he's hosting that night. He tells him to look at the young ladies who will be attending beside his daughter and to decide for himself if he still thinks that Juliet is the most beautiful of all. Paris accepts the invitation. Capulet gives one of his servants a list of the names of the party guests and he asks him to go around Verona to each of those people's houses to tell them that they're invited. The servant's name is Peter. He'd like to carry out his task, but the problem is Peter can't read so he has no idea what the names on the list are. As he's walking around Verona, he comes across Romeo and Benvolio, who he doesn't recognize as being part of the Montague family, and he asks them for help with the reading. Romeo reads the list for him. Among the people named are a certain guy called Mercutio, who's going to be introduced later, and a bunch of Capulets, including Tybalt, but also Rosaline, who is Capulet's niece. Seeing the name of the love of his life, Romeo asks Peter what the list is about, and Peter tells him that these are the people that Lord Capulet is inviting to his house for a party that night. After he leaves, Benvolio says that they should sneak into the party so that Romeo can see Rosaline among all the beautiful ladies of Verona and realize that she isn't all that exceptional. Romeo accepts to go, but he doesn't care about the other ladies of Verona, all he has in mind is that he's going to see Rosaline. Back at the Capulet house, Lady Capulet asks the nurse to call for her daughter so she can tell her about Paris' proposal. Juliet comes in, and this has to be my favorite scene of the play. Lady Capulet introduces the topic of marriage by making a comment that Juliet is of age now, according to her at least, and that prompts the nurse to get into a huge tirade about how she remembers when Juliet was a wee little toddler and the day she was big enough to stop breastfeeding, and she recalls an anecdote of when two-year-old Juliet fell on her head and cried and the nurse's husband picked her up and said, oh, did you fall on your face? You'll fall backward when you grow up, won't you, Jewel? which was a salacious joke because to fall backward was a phrase that meant to have sex. And when he said that, little Juliet instantly stopped crying and was like, yes! Sweet child had no idea what she was saying yes to, but the nurse found that hilarious and she still laughs her head off as she's retelling it and Lady Capulet has to ask her to be quiet already. The nurse has a lot of affection for Juliet, she pretty much raised her as her own child, and she says that all she wishes for is to see her girl get married. And well, that's the topic they're here for, isn't it? So Lady Capulet tells Juliet that Count Paris wants to marry her, and what does she think about that, isn't it amazing? Juliet isn't super thrilled by the idea of marriage, but she's very polite about it, and she says that she'll have a look at Paris at the party tonight, and she'll try to like him. And as she says that, Peter comes in to tell them that the guests have arrived and supper is served. Outside, we find Romeo, Benvolio, and their friend Mercutio wearing party masks. 
If you remember the list of party guests, Makusha was legitimately invited to the party because in the play, uh, Makusha is not a Montague, he's actually a kinsman of Prince Aeschylus, like Paris is. As the three friends are about to join the party, Benvolio and Makusha are quite cheerful, but Romeo is still in a somber mood. He has a bad feeling about going to this party, he says that he had a dream about it. Makusho tells him that he must have been visited by Queen Mab. When asked who Queen Mab is, he goes on a manic tirade explaining that she's a small magical being, the fairy's midwife, so probably a fairy herself, who rides her carriage over people as they sleep, causing them to dream. He gets pretty carried away and Romeo ends up telling him to calm down. Benvolio presses them to get moving because it's getting late and they're missing the party. And they go to the Capulet residence. When they arrive at the party, supper is over and people are starting to dance. Lord Capulet doesn't recognize Romeo and Benvolio under their masks, and he welcomes the three young men in. Tybalt is there, as well as Lady Capulet, the nurse, and of course Juliet, who is dancing with Paris. Romeo notices her right away. He's so moved by her beauty that he says to himself, but Tybalt is nearby, he hears Romeo's voice and recognizes it. Lord Capulet notices Tybalt's anger, and Tybalt points Romeo out to him and expresses his outrage that a Montague should be here. But Capulet doesn't mind Romeo being here. Romeo has the reputation of being a well-behaved young man and Capulet doesn't want Tybalt to make a scene. In the opening scene, Prince Aeschylus also said that if the Capulet or the Montagues were to cause trouble again, the people responsible were going to be put to death, so that's probably in Capulet's mind as well. Tybalt insists that this is unacceptable, but Capulet puts him in his place. and Tybalt ends up leaving. After Juliet's dance with Paris is over, Romeo goes to her and takes her hand.
but then they're interrupted by the nurse, who comes to tell Juliet that her mother wants to speak with her. Juliet goes to see her mother, all flustered, and Romeo asks the nurse who her mother is. The nurse tells him that Juliet is Lady Capulet's daughter, and Romeo realizes that she belongs to the rival family. He tries not to show his distress, and Benvolio comes to him to tell him that it's time to leave. As he's moving towards the door, Juliet asks her nurse to go and ask him his name. When the nurse comes back and tells her that he's Romeo, the son of Lord Montague, Juliet is horrified. She says to herself, but she hides her emotion, and now that all the guests are gone, they all go to bed. Outside, Romeo sneaks off ahead of Benvolio and Mercutio. They try to call him, but to no avail, so they end up giving up and going home. Romeo isn't about to go to sleep. His thoughts are still racing from his exchange with Juliet. He notices light coming from a window, and there she is, also deep in thoughts. Without seeing him, Juliet starts talking to herself, and he's delighted to hear her voice.
As Romeo reluctantly starts to leave, Juliet calls him back, trying to be discreet so she doesn't wake her family up. And she doesn't really have anything substantial to say, but she just wants to spend more time with him, and he's more than happy to keep talking to her as long as possible. But they eventually have to part because it's almost day. When the sun rises, we find Friar Lawrence. He's harvesting herbs and flowers and philosophizing about the medicinal and harmful properties possessed by plants. Romeo, who hasn't slept all night, comes to talk to him. Friar Lawrence asks him if he spent the night with Rosaline, but Romeo says, God, no, he's completely forgotten about Rosaline now. And he tells him that he was at Lord Capulet's party, that he met Juliet, and that they fell in love. Now all he wants is that Fry Lawrence accepts to marry them today. Fry Lawrence is taken aback by this sudden news. But in the end, Fry Lawrence accepts to perform the wedding ceremony because he's hoping that it will help mend the relationship between the Capulets and the Montagues and put an end to the feud. Romeo is super happy and excited, of course. In the meantime, Mercutio and Benvolio still don't know where Romeo is. Benvolio got confirmation by Romeo's servant that he didn't come home last night, and Mercutio is convinced that Romeo's elusiveness is due to the fact that he's still depressed over Rosaline not loving him. Benvolio remarks that Tybalt sent a letter to the Montague residence, and they deduce that he must be challenging Romeo to a fight. Mercutio jokes that Romeo might not be up to the challenge because his love for Rosaline is making him weak. Then Romeo comes in, all rosy-cheeked and happy despite his sleepless night. Mercutio confronts him about his sneaking off after the party, and Romeo says that he must be forgiven because he had extremely important business to attend to. Mercutio makes a salacious joke about Romeo spending the rest of the night with a girl, and Romeo jokes along with him, and honestly I wish I could just direct quote their exchange, but it literally requires one footnote every other line, even in the modern translation, to be understandable by the modern reader. So just trust me when I say, these guys are very witty and creative with language, and their minds are deep in the gutter. Then the Capulet's nurse comes to them.
hey, at least that one's plain enough. The nurse asks to talk to Romeo in private, and Makushu jokes that she must be a pimp. Then Makushu and Benvolio are off to Aunt Montague's house for lunch, while Romeo stays to heal the nurse. She says that Juliet sent her, but first of all, she warns Romeo that if he intends to play double with Juliet and doesn't actually intend to marry her, he'd better stop right there because it would be an awful thing to do to such a young lady. But Romeo is very much set on marriage, and he asks the nurse to tell Juliet to come to Friar Lawrence's cell in the afternoon so the friar can marry them in secret. He also says that he's going to climb up to Juliet's bedroom in the evening so he can spend the night with her. He gives the nurse some money to make sure she'll speak well of him to Juliet, but honestly, the nurse already trusts him, and she's pretty excited that her girl is going to get married to the man she loves. She tells Romeo that Count Paris wants to marry Juliet too, but Juliet doesn't want him at all and constantly raves about Romeo instead. So things are looking pretty good and the nurse goes back to the Capulet's house to report back to Juliet. At the Capulet house, Juliet is anxiously waiting for the nurse to return. She sent her three hours ago and she still isn't back. But the nurse finally arrives, and Juliet is dying to hear Romeo's message, but the nurse is weary from all the walking, and she plays up her exhaustion just to tease Juliet. And after some more delaying, the nurse finally tells her Romeo's message. She tells her to pretend that she's going to confession, and at Fry Lawrence's cell, Romeo will be waiting for her so they can get married. Juliet is beyond happy, and she hurries off to Fry Lawrence's cell. At the Friar's cell, Fry Lawrence tries to temper Romeo's passion and excitement with some words of wisdom, but Romeo isn't listening. Juliet arrives and rushes to embrace him. And Friar Lawrence asks them to follow him so they can perform the marriage ceremony. In the meantime, that afternoon, Mercutio and Benvolio are hanging out in Verona. Makusho seems to be a bit irritable and unstable, maybe the heat is playing on his nerves. Benvolio tries to convince him to come home with him because it's a hot day, the scapulets all over the place, and he has a bad feeling about staying here. But Makusho dismisses his concerns. Enter Tybalt with some of his Capulet friends. He's looking for Romeo. Romeo just got married to Juliet, so Tybalt is now his kinsman, and he certainly doesn't want to get in a fight with him.
Realizing what just happened, Tybalt and the other Capulets ran away from the scene. At first, Mercutio's friends don't realize how bad the wound is, but Mercutio knows that he's about to die. Benvolio carries Mercutio away. Romeo realizes that Mercutio was killed to defend him and his honor, and he blames his love for Juliet for making him so weak. Benvolio comes back to confirm that Mercutio just died. Then Tybalt comes back, and Romeo sees red. He takes out his sword and swears to avenge Mercutio or die trying. Romeo kills Tybalt. When Tybalt is dead, Benvolio urges Romeo to run away because people are coming and if he gets caught, Prince Aeschylus will have him executed, so Romeo runs. Enter Prince Aeschylus, Lord and Lady Montague, Lord and Lady Capulet, and a bunch of citizens. The prince asks for an explanation as to what happened, and Benvolio tells him that Tybalt killed Mercutio and was then killed by Romeo. Lady Capulet is extremely sad that Tybalt, her nephew, is dead, but her sadness quickly turns to anger and she asks the prince for retribution. But when Benvolio reaffirms that Tybalt is the one who started the killings, Prince Aeschylus decides to condemn Romeo not to death but to exile. He's even more fed up with the feud now that it has caused the death of his kinsman Mercutio and he says that he'll be deaf to please from either family to change Romeo's sentence. At the Capulet residence, Juliet is impatiently waiting for the night to see Romeo again. But the nurse arrives in a state of shock, and after she speaks incoherently about someone being killed, which makes Juliet believe that Romeo is dead, she manages to gather herself enough that Juliet understands that Romeo killed her cousin Tybalt, and is now banished. She's absolutely horrified. At first, her horror is directed at Romeo's actions, and she blames the heavens for making her fall in love with such a man. But as soon as the nurse joins in and speaks a word against Romeo, Juliet is angry that she would dare to speak badly of him, and she reasons that the only reason Romeo killed Tybalt must be because Tybalt was threatening to kill him if he didn't. Thank you. 
Juliet is sure that Romeo is already gone and that she'll never be able to see him ever again and she's in such distress that she basically tells the nurse that she's going to kill herself. But the nurse says that she knows where Romeo is hiding and she's going to go to him and bring him to her when night falls, as was planned. Juliet is beyond grateful and she gives the nurse a ring for Romeo before she goes. Romeo has in fact been hiding in Fry Lawrence's cell. When Fry Lawrence tells him that he's banished from Verona, he basically has the same reaction as Juliet. He's devastated because he can't stand the thought of being away from Juliet. Fry Lawrence tries to reason with him, but he doesn't listen. Then they hear someone knock on the door. The nurse identifies herself, and Fry Lawrence lets her in while Romeo is still crying his eyes out. When he sees her, he presses her to tell him what Juliet thinks of him now that she knows that he killed her cousin, and the nurse says that all Juliet does is cry and cry. Romeo threatens to harm himself and Fry Lawrence gets angry with him. He calls him an ungrateful child and tells him to stop whining and count his blessings. The friar's words help Romeo regain his composure. The nurse goes ahead to the Capet residence to let Juliet know that Romeo is coming, but before she does, she gives Romeo the ring that Juliet gave her, and that gives him some more strength. Friar Lawrence gives his last instructions to Romeo on how he should escape to Mantua by daybreak. Romeo thanks him for his help and goes to join Juliet for the night. Very late at night, at the Capuet residence, Juliet's parents are unsuspectingly talking with Count Paris while she's in her bedroom with Romeo. Lord Capuet tells Paris that with Tybalt's death, they haven't had the opportunity to get Juliet's consent to the marriage with him, but they intend to talk to her about it first thing in the morning. Actually, it becomes apparent that Lord Capulet doesn't really care if Juliet wants to be married to Paris or not, and he asks his wife to tell her that she will get married to him in two days. In the morning, Romeo and Juliet wake up in Juliet's bedroom.
the nurse pops in and warns them that Lady Capulet is on her way. They kiss one last time and hurry to the balcony. They exchange a few more words, but Romeo has to leave before anyone notices him. Lady Capulet enters Juliet's room, and Juliet pretends that Tipple's death is the reason she looks so sad. Lady Capulet says that she brings good news that she's hoping will lift Juliet's spirits and she announces that Lord Capulet scheduled her marriage to Count Paris this Thursday morning. Juliet is having none of that, of course. She refuses adamantly and asks why the rush. Lord Capulet and the nurse enter the room, and Lady Capulet tells her husband that Juliet refuses to get married. Lord Capulet becomes absolutely enraged. He calls his daughter an ungrateful brat and much worse things. Even Lady Capulet and the nurse think that he's going too far, and they try to speak up, but he refuses to calm down. He says to Juliet that she can either obey him and get married to Paris, or he'll refuse to acknowledge her as his daughter and let her die in the streets. And he storms out. Juliet tries to get some comfort from her mother, but she's completely cold. and she leaves. So Juliet tries to go to the nurse and get support from her. She points out that she can't possibly get married to Paris, not only because she doesn't love him, but also because she's already married to Romeo. But the nurse says, When she hears this, Juliet fully realizes that she's on her own here. Not even her nurse, who's basically her best friend, is on her side. But instead of giving in to despair, she says, Alright, if you think it's the best course of action, I'll do that. I'll marry Paris. She tells the nurse to go tell her mother that she's going to confession at Fry Lawrence's cell, because she needs to repent for disobeying her father. But as soon as the nurse is gone, Juliet curses her and her advice, and she goes to Fry Lawrence to ask for his help. When she arrives at the Friar's cell, she finds that Paris is there, who just told Friar Francis about their upcoming wedding. When he sees Julia, Paris tries to be a bit flirtatious, and he's already calling her his wife, but she stays distant, or as much as politeness allows. 
She uses the excuse that she came for confession to have Paris leave her alone with the friar. When she asks him for help, Friar Lawrence is supportive, but at first he has no idea how to circumvent the wedding. Juliet reveals that she has a knife, and she says that if even the friar, in his wisdom, can't think of a solution, she'll kill herself rather than get married to Paris. So Friar Lawrence figures something out. He shows her a vial with a potion in it. And he tells her to go back home and pretend that she's agreeing to marry Paris. Then tomorrow night, the night before the wedding, she'll drink the potion. It will make her lose consciousness, her body will become cold and it will look like she's dead for 42 hours. She will then be carried to the familial tomb where all the dead Capulets rest. Meanwhile, Friar Lawrence will send a message to Romeo to let him know what's going on and to call him to the tomb so that when Juliet wakes up, they can escape to Mantua together. Juliet loves this plan and she takes the vial without hesitation. Friar Lawrence promises that he'll send a fellow friar to Mantua to deliver the message to Romeo and Juliet goes back home with the vial. At her house, she goes to her father to apologize. She says that Fray Lawrence talked some sense into her and she asks for forgiveness. Lord Capriot is happy to hear it, he forgives her, and in his enthusiasm he even decides to advance the date of the wedding to the next day, so Wednesday instead of Thursday. Juliet doesn't protest. After all, her plan still works. She just needs to take Friar Lawrence's potion tonight instead of tomorrow night. That evening, she asks the nurse to help her pick her wedding dress and jewels, as if she had every intention to get married the next day. Then she asks the nurse to leave her alone for the night. She takes out the vial. Even if she's afraid, the thought of Romeo gives her the courage to drink the potion. As soon as she does, she falls on her bed motionless. The 
the next morning, the nurse comes to wake Juliet up for her big day and she finds her seemingly dead. So she freaks out. Lady Capulet hears her and comes into the bedroom. Lord Capulet, Paris and Fray Lawrence follow and they all start freaking out. But Fry Lawrence interrupts their lamentations. He basically tells them that although it's understandable that they'd be sad, they should instead be joyful that their dear daughter is now in heaven where she can enjoy eternal life. So they try to gather themselves and start preparing for the funeral. In the meantime, Romeo is in Mantua. During his night there, he had a pleasant dream about being awakened from death by a kiss from Juliet, and he's in a good mood. But then his servant Balthazar comes back from Verona. Balthazar was just at Juliet's funeral, where he saw her body be taken to the Capulet tomb. When he tells Romeo about it, Romeo becomes very pale and he asks Balthazar to gather her stuff so they can get ready to leave for Verona as soon as night comes. Romeo then goes to an apothecary to buy poison from him. Selling poison in Mantua is punishable by death, but Romeo, who can see that the apothecary is very poor, offers him a lot of money and the apothecary ends up accepting to sell him some. In Verona, Fray Lawrence finds out, horrified, that the letter that he sent to Romeo to tell him about Juliet's plan never got to him. What happened is, he gave the letter to his fellow Friar John, who was supposed to go to Mantua and give it to Romeo. But instead of leaving straight away, Friar John wanted another Friar to go with him, so he went to get that Friar. Now the problem is, that friar was visiting the sick, and when Friar John got to him, the town health officials started suspecting that they both might be infected, so they quarantined them with the sick people, and they couldn't leave until just now. So the letter never left Verona. Friar Lawrence realizes that he needs to go to the Capulet tomb to be there when Juliet wakes up, because Romeo has no idea that he's supposed to pick her up, so he hurries to his cell to get his tools before going to the graveyard. After nightfall at the graveyard, Count Paris has come to pay his respects to Juliet. He puts flowers at the door of her tomb. He is soon alerted by the sound of someone coming, and he hides to avoid being seen there at this hour. It's Romeo and Balthazar coming. When they arrive at the tomb, Romeo gives Balthazar a letter that he asks him to give to Lord Montague, his father, in the morning. Then he orders Balthazar to go and let him do what he has to do alone. But Balthazar is worried about Romeo, and instead of leaving, he just pretends to leave and hides nearby. Thinking that he's alone, Romeo starts opening the door of the vault. Paris, still hidden in the dark, recognizes him as the Montague who killed Tybalt. Paris believes that Juliet died of grief because of Tybalt's death, and so he thinks that Romeo is indirectly responsible for her death, and that he must have come to desecrate the bodies. Paris comes out of hiding and confronts Romeo.
They fight and Romeo, with the energy of desperation, kills Paris. With his last breath, Paris asks for his body to be laid down next to Juliet's, and Romeo, who knows that Paris is a good man and a relative of Mercutio, grants his request. When he sees Juliet in the vault, Romeo is amazed by how beautiful she still looks. He kisses her, then takes out the poison, drinks it all, and dies in a few seconds. Outside in the graveyard, Friar Francis arrives. He sees light coming from inside the tomb, and Balthazar tells him that Romeo has been in there for a while now, but since he ordered him not to follow him, he hasn't dared get any closer. Friar Lawrence goes inside the tomb alone and sees Romeo and Paris' dead bodies. Before he can piece together what happened, Juliet starts waking up. She sees Friar Lawrence and asks where Romeo is. At that moment, noise comes from outside, indicating that people are coming. Friar Lawrence gets scared and he tries to get Juliet to escape with him, quickly. But when she sees that Romeo lies dead next to her, she refuses to leave, and Friar Lawrence ends up running away without her. She kisses his lips, but there isn't any poison left on them. She hears more noise from outside. Right as she dies, watchmen enter the tomb and see the dead bodies. The chief watchman notices that Julia's body is still warm and she's bleeding, although she's supposed to have died two days ago. He immediately sends some of his subordinates to wake up Prince Aeschylus, the Capulets and the Montagues. 
A watchman comes to him with Balthazar and another with Fray Lawrence, who they were able to catch. The chief watchman orders them to stay here until the prince arrives to interrogate them. Prince Aeschylus, Lord Capulet and Lady Capulet arrive and the chief watchman exposes the situation to them. Juliet's parents go through the shock of their daughter's death for a second time, as they see that she in fact just died from her stab wound. Lord Montague arrives a little later and announces that his wife died during the night out of grief over Romeo's banishment. They show him that Romeo is now dead too. Before they all give in to their grief, Prince Aeschylus wants to understand exactly what happened. He calls forth Friar Lawrence, who reveals that Romeo and Juliet were married and explains Juliet's plan to fake her death to escape to Mantua with her husband. Balthazar is questioned as well, and he explains how Romeo came back to Verona after hearing that Juliet was dead. He hands the prince the letter that Romeo told him to give to Lord Montague, and from it the prince gets the remaining details of the story. And finally, after many years of hatred and violence, Capulets and Montagues make peace as the night ends. And that's the end of the story of Romeo and Juliet. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll put part two on screen here as soon as it's out. And I hope to see you there. Bye for now.